vini në seminarin e radhës të Departamentit të Matematikës. Sot kam knaci që ta prezentoj folqin e radhës, është doktor Bakhtjar Vogel, si zakonisht prezentimi dhe të mohet në gjuhën angleze, pra ndaj dhe dhe të vazhdoj në gjuhën angleze. So I'm delighted, now I'm switching to English, to introduce to you our next speaker in the math department seminar. It's Bakhtjar Vogel, who is a senior lecturer in computer science and media technology at the faculty of Technology and Society uh, at Malmö University in Sweden. He has a PhD in computer science from Linnaeus University in Sweden and is affiliated with the Internet of Things and People Research Center, where he carries his research under this domain. So um, we are delighted to welcome you, Bastiar. Thank you so much for accepting the invitation. Uh, as you know, the seminar lasts uh, an hour, including all the comments uh, at the end. Um, and it, 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 its aim is uh, for its target audience is a very wide one. So, uh, you know, you have uh, mathematicians in the audience, not just computer scientists. And, uh, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Andrew, for the introduction. Nice introduction, actually. Um, then I will be continuing English since. Uh, and uh, I would be delighted also to speak in Albanian, so it's fine. So my my presentation today is going to be about a sort of uh, design principles to discuss about the design principles for Internet of Things, and also what leads to 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 design such systems when it comes to make them more open and more secure as well, because we are heavily using IoT and will be uh, using in the next, next generations, starting from the connected lights, cars, and so on and so forth. So a little bit uh, more maybe about myself so that people uh, uh, know uh, where, I'm, where am I from. So first of all, uh, currently I am a senior lecturer and in computer science at Malmö University, Faculty of Technology. Before that, I was a postdoc at Linnaeus University, and at the same university, I did also my PhD studies in computer science. <clears throat> I, throughout these years, I was also connected to uh, Pristina, Kosovo, uh, where I worked a sort of as a consultant and IT, IT, IT architect in Interadvia, and we did a couple of projects there. Before that, I also worked as software engineer, software developer, and so on and so forth. Uh, so where do I come from? Uh, perhaps you will recognize uh, this, and these pictures are taken by myself a couple of years ago when I was a social media enthusiast, but now I'm not, but I still do take pictures, but I don't post them. <laughs> and uh, so this is uh, Prizren, as you know, it's uh, the town that I, where I have been born and uh, raised. Uh, until uh, 2006 when I came to study in Sweden and now I'm established or still establishing myself in Sweden. Um, and then of course, uh, where do I live now? Currently I live in Lund. Uh, I used to live in Malmö as well, but these two cities are very much connected. It's like 20 kilometers far. And uh, this is the university building where I work. It's the Faculty of Technology, but also other faculties as well. It's a quite big technology. And I think Elliot was uh, visiting us. And I would be happy, happy now to host you, uh, anybody from you, if you want to visit uh, this our institution here. So culturally, of course, I would like to mention also some food differences. Uh, when it comes to, I mean, still it's food, right? But of course, uh, in prison, we like to eat uh, chebapa and with mekaimak. And of course, here in Sweden, uh, the most dominant food is uh, fish, which is the lax or uh, salmon with uh, boiled potatoes and some salad. And that's about it. Everything is almost boiled. Okay. Uh, then, some research projects I'm involved uh, currently. I think Chudrim also mentioned that I'm part of Internet of Things and People Research Center. 
And that is also a research project funded by some governmental agencies. And I'm part of that. And uh, recently I got some sort of managerial role as well for education part. So I'm working with that closely with other researchers. And I had my own couple of my own projects uh, that are generated within in Swedish context from, pro, uh, from different funding agencies. One was related to drones, uh, which has been finished the uh, previous year, actually. And then some other projects which were about sort of what I'm going to, to talk about today. And uh, industry projects as well. I was also involved in some sort of uh, consultancy on the development of smart homes management systems human resources for the government uh, through the, the company there uh, that I was involved. However, what is my, my, my research uh, is based on sort of three area. One is web and mobile engineering, including internet of things so that I see myself as an inseparable part of, of web and mobile, and also sort of more detailed <laughs> Uh, research into software engineering and software architecture, where I kind of uh, try to establish the concept of an open architecture to provide to users a bit more flexible and evolvable and usable systems that could be applied in different domains. And when I say domains, it's like learning domain, it could be a health domain, it could be smart homes, and et cetera, et cetera. So how did all this uh, sort of research come up with? Of course, uh, uh, it started from the mainframe computing. I think it's nice to always give some sort of uh, uh, initial, uh, even though we, are, we, are, we know about the mainframe computing, but it's just to see how fast the evolution uh, happened between the mainframe to the mobile internet that we are currently heavily using it. So you could see in this diagram uh, from mainframe computing that it was like huge one computer with single board, like around a room size. And now we are carrying our mobile phones, which has uh, much more capacities. And of course, the, the main essence of this presentation is the mobile internet here of this slide. And then of course, we could see that already in 2015, uh, <clears throat> we have more mobile internet users than desktop users. Before that year, we were mostly using desktop computers for accessing the internet, but now we are using almost everything. So we, our refrigerators are connected to, to, is connected to the internet. Our smart lights, we have smart lights that are very cheap, are becoming very cheap lately and et cetera, et cetera. So what is interesting is that there is today, there are more devices connected to internet than people living in the world. And how that is uh, interesting to analyze because not everybody has connectivity in the world, right? But still we have a computer, we have a smart TV, we have a smart uh, light and smart everything. Uh, pretty much uh, a very uh, kind of interesting developments uh, that is going to be still rapidly evolving in the next decade. So if we reflect back, how did this all this evolution started? Uh, I'm not sure if you are familiar with CERN in Switzerland, where Tim Berners-Lee, the, the main guy, where, which kind of invented the WWW or World Wide Web that we call. It was him that in, in early, in, in, during 90s, one plus two years, he went to his uh, boss, let's say, and he, he he made the proposal said, this is my proposal. And the proposal said, World Wide Web. The idea of his was to share the data with all the phys physical researchers, right? Because uh, all the physicians, scientists needed to come to CERN to collect the data and make uh, science about that data. And his idea was to distribute that kind of data <clears throat> so that people do not need to come all over the world to CERN. And fast forward, we evolved to the concept of uh, Web 2.0, right? Because with 1.0, the idea was to just to share. So we could just read the data, but not write. And then we have this fast forward evolution with mobile phones like Android and uh, also iPhone that has emerged. 
So the idea, and also different social media sites where we had the nature of also of read write. And now we are kind of researching uh, the third, let's say, phase, which is so-called Web 3.0, still is evolving, especially now. I'm not sure if you are familiar with blockchain technologies. So the idea is that. Uh, new uh, new generation of technologies will be uh, based on blockchain as well. <clears throat> and uh, the Web 3.0, uh, the, the, the architecture of Web 3.0 will be based on such, such technologies, even though it's going to be uh, a lot of challenges encountering this. So the idea of this evolution one, two, and now three is that now with three, we it's not anymore about read write because it's something very easy that people can do today, but it's also to create some sort of understanding. And this is the, the challenge that we as researchers should uh, try to uh, emphasize this sort of under better understanding of the technologies of uh, data mainly that is around us. And what are we going to do with, with this kind of data? What kind of decisions we need to make with this kind of data? So. We started from sharing, we went to contributing, and now we are dealing with a sort of contextualized aspect of these kind of technologies that are heavily connected to internet. But throughout these years, if we reflect, I mean, we always had also security and privacy aspects emerging, right? Because the moment that you share the data, you share the technology, there is also security concerns coming uh, and evolving from this kind of. Uh, so I think as long as the message is that as long as uh, we will have this kind of evolution of web one, two, three, and tomorrow maybe four, we will have also security four following us because it's something that will bother us as, as humans. So this also leads to sort of uh, internet of things, right? Uh, so what are at stakes today? We have a lot of, a lot of, uh, different platforms, right, for, for IoT, uh, Amazon, Microsoft, you name it. And there are uh, more than 300 IoT platforms in, the, in this market today that kind of offer integration of different tools, especially to developers, but also consumers and users. Uh, but if we, if we look at it a bit more deeply, we could see that not every IoT platform is an IoT platform. And why, this, why is that? Because we can see there is different kind of platforms and often uh, developers lack understanding about, okay, what kind of platform it is for, for what it is. And we have like connectivity platforms that are mainly M2M platforms. Uh, IS, backends, backends platforms, hardware specific software platforms, and consumer uh, enterprise or software kind of platforms. And this uh, kind of different platforms, the availability of these platforms offers a very much a complex uh, kind of phenomenon that create confusion, especially for the developers. It's like comparing apples to uh, oranges, right? Uh, so th that means that not all IoT platforms are the same. And that brings the challenge of uh, having this kind of differences also in the mobile landscape, right? So we have different smartphones, we have different versions of operating system, and this brings the challenge of fragmentation. So we are constantly fragmented with different kind of platforms, uh, whether that is mobile or uh, IoT platforms, right? And uh, despite that, a lot of research has been happening in web kind of technologies when it comes to uh, kind of having more unified view of developing an application and running in multiple devices. Still, uh, we could see that there is a vast uh, kind of majority of the technologies available, even in the, in the mobile kind of landscape, uh, there is fragmentation happening as well. So, so we believe that uh, these platforms almost always uh, are based on different standards. And also, of course, uh, that the challenge is more than just the mobility of this kind of uh, devices, 
but we believe that it concerns the, the heterogeneity, right? And even though these devices are so heterogeneous, we still we still shouldn't look at this as a, as, as a bug, so that because we believe that diversity is not a bug, but it's an opportunity for us as researchers to address the concerns from the from the users. And uh, of course, uh, currently we almost uh, are reaching to this next level of uh, environment uh, where we live in now. Uh, if you go today, for example, in a shopping mall, you would see a lot of uh, things that are connected to internet since you enter the shopping mall. And then there is a number of applications and devices that already interact with people, right? So we already live in a, in a sort of uh, worldwide computing environment. Uh, and of course, this kind of uh, computing environment brings a lot of uh, new landscapes as well when it comes to when it comes to the usage, but also the deployment and every kind of aspect uh, related to this kind of new environment. And when we look at it from a more <clears throat> scientific point of view, what is happening in this kind of worldwide computing environment that we live on, from the computer science perspective, but also a user kind of perspective, I would say that there is a <clears throat> constantly generated new requirements that kind of pushes the technologies to move, uh, to develop faster. And then there is a need to constantly change, to modify the system, to address the user needs because there is a new thing. So how do you address? But it's very complex from the software engineering perspective to address this uh, kind of changes in a, in a rapid way. So there is a lot of uncertainty into these uh, situations. And these uncertainties uh, lead sometimes to incomplete uh, false results and also may kind of harm the longevity of the IoT systems. And of course, uh, if you reflect back to some of my research earlier, we have understood that uncertainty affects many, many dimensions, the goals, the context, and uh, also the functional and quality properties of different uh, IoT systems. Uh, and then, of course, this for some companies, some IT industry that I would say uh, would reflect to the sort of costs and that those costs could be uh, time, but also could be money. If we, if we uh, just translate time, it would anyhow translate to, to money, to cost to the, to the company. So how do we address this? In, uh, there is multiple ways that we were trying to to do the research, but I would like to summarize these challenges. So we have this sort of fragmented landscape and it's very easy today to be fragmented because usually startups, especially if they want to develop a product, their aim is to release the product to the market as soon as possible. But then what is happening is in, in, in the aftermath is that, is that there is challenges, there is fragmentation, there is a lot of uncertainties, and also there is security issues as well. And of course, there are very little abstractions when it comes to uh, understanding uh, this kind of uh, challenges. There is many, many uh, protocols, APIs, and it's often for the developer, it's, it's very hard to maintain over time. And as I mentioned, also the uncertainties are there. So reflecting to my research goals prior, I would say that the aim of general, my personal research and the, the research center here, we are aiming to explore a little bit more the openness aspects from it when it comes to, to from the software engineering perspective and provide some sort of design pr principles because we believe with these design principles, companies can utilize these design principles in order to address the concerns that we are raising uh, in this presentation. And of course, when it comes to methodological studies, I did, uh, I used mixed methods, uh, case studies, uh, and different approaches like uh, prototyping, uh, systematic literature review. We even did interviews to understand <clears throat> uh, more uh, what is happening, for example, from the security point of view uh, when it comes to a certain IoT concept. 
And uh, despite that, this kind of uh, uh, evolution of these technologies, uh, we have a lot of uh, research also happening uh, into the open hardware world. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that you know, uh, let's say, uh, and, uh, Arduino, for example, and uh, this kind of provides a lot of opportunities for us to just test the small, small portions of the technologies today. And of course, we have also the open web uh, because the web is open to everybody. And uh, the idea is that with uh, with uh, with web, we see that all the environments are connected and interlinked. And if not interrelated to one another and the idea of the web is just not just a device centric idea idea right so the web itself is a is an open kind of development platform but it depends which tools we are utilizing in order to to kind of address some of the challenges we should not neglect also the iterative process when it comes to the development and the design aspects of the IoT technologies, but not only. So we should have a sort of more iterative process in order for us to quickly design, develop, test, and evaluate. And it is in the center of this iterative process should we should have user so that we could design a system that meets kind of users, right? And that is called user experience design. And why this is relevant? Because uh, we need to know how to translate the business goals to the technology and design sectors. Because this, this way, we can make sure that business is what drives the features and the design. And then we need to know how to explain technology constraint to the business and design sectors. And uh, we need to know how to communicate the design ideas to the business and technology sectors. And I believe with this kind of process, we could create the value because the user is the central to, the, to this value, right? So it's important to, uh, when we design the technologies to have user at the center of the design. And that is called user experience design. Um, uh, in my re research uh, with one of the colleagues we did, uh, we used a very kind of uh, web uh, programming course, which was uh, JavaScript, and uh, we gave students this kind of open tools, right? O open hardware, open software, uh, and we said you should use web technologies to develop a certain certain prototype. Of course, methodologically, we implemented Scrum and for four weeks, uh, I would say, uh, five weeks, sorry, they, they, made, they developed an amazing prototype. It was only five, six students in the group. And they used, and this was already in 2017, we published a paper about the results of this paper in 2018. You could see that they developed a smart lights uh, kind of solution five years ago for five weeks, a quite amazing technology, uh, both web kind of technology, they use web technology, but also physical computing. And you could control with one button, uh, several kind of uh, functionalities. And the idea of this project, interaction in the smart home using a prototyping approach, the idea was that we need to develop a technology to, support elderly when they live alone in their home so they don't need to have uh, multiple kind of functionalities uh, but just with one button so with one button they could turn on their lights if they are in the sleeping room they could turn off as well and if they hold the button there is a sort of alarm generated so because his health is not is not uh, uh, right and if he goes to the kitchen, in the context of the kitchen, the button changes the settings. So the button adapts to different settings. So there is different functionality. And this is what the students did with like different kind of modes, like night mode, day mode, panic mode, and with different kind of events. So with one button, they could uh, you could develop many, many uh, events. Uh, you could develop many, many functionalities 
uh, uh, it was quite an interesting project, but also quite an interesting project to see that with this kind of open technologies, how fast you are able to deliver a sort of nice working prototype. Uh, and then, of course, this was an interface where you could reconfigure the, the system so you could attach new kind of lights and different settings. So, uh, but what do we mean by, by this kind of openness? Uh, so we believe that openness is a higher order concept characterized by access to information, but also other resources. It is about collaborative participation and it is about also transparency of resources and actions. And of course, uh, it's finally about opening up the technologies or making it non-inclusive because this, we, we have seen it with our simple research that students are able to make an amazing prototype just within five weeks. Uh, and then of course we, <clears throat> did more research about the openness and we believe that openness is a need in IIT because it's a platform for innovation and invention. You can uh, develop faster uh, and easier and in more convenient way, uh, as we have seen. We believe that it's also a solution for interoperability, but also standardization. And uh, it can provide a system that is uh, more flexible, more extensible, right? And, and more customizable. And of course, in the end, with the main benefits that is related to the cost that I have mentioned in one of the slides previous, previously. And then of course, uh, we needed to understand what do we mean by this kind of openness aspect, we have uh, identified a couple of uh, dimensions of openness, uh, which was uh, related to flexibility, evolvability, customizability, and extensibility. So with this kind of aspects, you, we could easily enable the system to be more interoperable, more kind of enable to grow from the, uh, and evolve from the bottom up, and uh, more flexible and also uh, address the, the dynamic requirements and shorten, shorten the development time. Based on this, we have come up with, uh, with uh, design principles, uh, open architecture design pr principles that we are still working with some of this in order to validate uh, with different uh, IT and IoT companies that we are working in our research center here. Another study we did was related to openness, but in I, of IoT platforms. And we have uh, identified a couple of IoT, open IoT platforms that are being used in, in, in among researchers mostly, because these have been collected from the scientific articles, this data. And uh, it was interesting to see that uh, all the researchers believe the main dimensions of openness or aspects uh, are open source, open APIs, open standards, open data. And there is also some other notions that are not really specified in this kind of data. And then uh, another research that I'm involved now with one of my PhD students at this department is about uh, addressing one component of openness, which is flexibility. What we are trying to do, we are building an open sort of hardware uh, uh, <clears throat> and which is a very lightweight system in order to uh, analyze what is happening in, around the classroom where, where, where students learn, what is their collaborative patterns, what is happening. And that is called multimodal learning analytic, analytic systems where we use computer vision, we use also audio, but also we use physiological aspects as well, so that we know also the emotions of the students around the table. And we have provided this sort of global system of, we call it Mbox. Uh, and uh, here you could see that uh, the idea is that we integrate also uh, machine learning here and its models to kind of address the latest uh, challenges of how uh, students learn, what kind of content we need to provide them and so on and so forth. But uh, 
despite that we have some results, we believe that openness uh, doesn't come from free, right? Uh, because we have uh, other aspects as well, especially that security is never guaranteed in these kind of uh, systems. And uh, why is that? We could see that uh, together with these developments, uh, these devices provide us a lot of convenience and efficiencies to use it in our homes. But there is also, it, at the same time, this kind of open technologies, they also offer us a lot of threats from hackers. For example, what was interesting is that the firm checkpoint in maybe 2019, they did a study and they, analyzed that some hackers were kind of uh, uh, possible to uh, attack uh, Philips Hue smart light bulbs. So they, it's not that they attacked, but they simply just went through the smart light and then they kind of hacked the whole network of certain houses. So this was a sort of uh, a product that uh, it's done by Philips Hue, which is a quite a big company, but still, they didn't think about security from, from day one. <clears throat> so it was a lot of challenges then to address this security attack. And there is, of course, many, many security attacks. A uh, study from HP revealed that uh, there, were, there are around 25 vulnerabilities uh, that are active and passive when it comes to this kind of attacks. And I will not go into the details, but just wanted to tell you that there is a lot of challenges when it comes to IoT security attacks uh, in the in, in, in nowadays in in our world. Um, so we believe that uh, <clears throat> security in IoT uh, uh, is highly exploitable and uh, are easily exploited target. Imagine drones. Uh, that we are lately using it. How do we trust drones? What kind of vulnerabilities, for example, these drones can pose to us? So there is a growth in attack surface or attack vectors, a rapid increase in a number of security attacks. And there is a personal and sensitive and enterprise data as well when it comes to data security and data privacy solutions. And often security from the practitioners that where they develop this kind of IoT technologies is uh, ignored. And uh, they lack, for example, security expertise, cost savings and time trade-off. And there is poor quality of software development yet, despite this kind of uh, technologies that we have in place. And that leads to a lot of security bugs that we often do not address, like a Philips Hue, Hue light. And uh, of course, one approach that we believe should be addressed from our studies is that uh, we need to have a more proactive approach rather than retroactive, such as with, with Philips Hue, where they retroactively start to implement the security measures, but not proactively. So we believe that security should be integrated into the design process when it comes to the very first design aspects of the system. <clears throat> so the additional goal based on this kind of aspects was to also uh, understand and provide insights to IoT practitioners about security and privacy aspect, not only, only, uh, only uh, open IoT design, but we need to also uh, address the security because uh, this leads to the difficult situations and uh, also to like costs, kind of increases the cost when it comes to address the security in, 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 a, in a retroactive way. Uh, we have understood that there is quite some uh, openness uh, trends uh, in security aspects. So one of the most highlighted trends is openness because people like to use open systems, but still, as I mentioned, uh, it doesn't come uh, as, a, as, a, <clears throat> uh, as free because uh, often with open security, open systems, we could design more easier and fast development uh, of the technologies. And then we have also uh, how, uh, when it comes to using open data, open source, there is a lot of technologies in place. 
And then uh, I, I have introduced the open architecture and uh, just to make a connection that now we are adding more kind of components into the model, which is about security. That's why uh, we are uh, kind of dealing with security aspects as well when it comes to open systems. And there were some trends that we have identified. There is the fast global technologies uh, where people try to connect everything to public network and connect things uh, sometimes, as I mentioned, were not originally designed to be connected to internet. And this is a very, very uh, important point. So that's why we need uh, more security and pri privacy that should be applied uh, proactively and that's why it brings us to the <clears throat> to the main kind of uh, aspect of researching some sort of model that would make uh, uh, understanding and the development of this of this kind of technologies. Some security challenges uh, is are related to the challenges to resource constraints because we have a processing power, we have a pow battery power, memory constraints. So what is happening uh, if there is a memory constraint in sort of certain device where uh, you cannot address the security aspects. Then heterogeneity, but fragmentation, interoperability, and compatibility. Then challenges related to privacy, uh, which is the nature of data, the ubiquity of data, the amount of data, and all, a lot of things replaces users as well. Nowadays, as we can see, challenges on how to upgrade the software because uh, if the software is in runtime how do we make an upgrade so that users do not are not affected uh, and then challenges related to uh, operational environment where there is like large nodes uh, multiple modalities dynamic and distributed systems right so these are some of the security challenges uh, overall uh, we did a study, uh, another study on uh, my one of my latest projects, uh, securing IoT devices with drones. Uh, we did uh, four experiments uh, with uh, commercial drones. The idea was to understand how easily you could hack these kind of devices. Uh, and uh, within these four experiments, uh, we uh, had a couple of scenarios where like we could switch the controls. So uh, one user, for example, is using an, uh, a drone and another user can just simply with a $5 uh, tool, which is called uh, Node MCU, is very easily, you don't need to be advanced hacker. You could be an ordinary user, just follow the instructions on the web. You could uh, hack a drone and take the control of the drone without the owner of the drone realizing what you're doing. You could download all the data and uh, you could do multiple things. You can uh, also attack the Wi-Fi of the data. You can attack the drone or crash the drone. So uh, it was very interesting uh, finding uh, that how easy today uh, with an off-the-shelf products uh, that are highly kind of exploitable, uh, targets in terms of uh, privacy, but also security aspects. And uh, we could easily uh, understood that all the media that was created in the in this uh, drone, we could download it again without the owner uh, knowing it. And but of course, you cause the privacy violation. So this was kind of a main experiments. How easy is to sort of hack a commercial drone today? without being an advanced user. And then uh, we believe that in general, uh, security is not any more a uh, technical issue, but also other uh, kind of technologies that we, we, we develop. So security problem is not a tool anymore or an implementation issue, but we believe it's more of what people and process issue. So we need to have some sort of more mechanism into place uh, because we believe that security starts with an awareness and right mindset. Uh, so security uh, often uh, is expressed in two forms. 
First, uh, it refers to the technical measures. The IoT practitioner should take when developing an IoT system, but also refers to the progress towards a more secure organizational culture uh, of the employees because employees need to have security in mind, even though that he, he is a simple uh, developer, he needs to know how to integrate the design aspect of certain security issues because otherwise we'll have a lot of issues when it comes to to the to the uh, deployment of this kind of IoT technologies. And here, uh, one of the results uh, from the other study is that we have provided, let's say, a sort of toolbox when it comes to IoT uh, companies that they could utilize in order to address some of the challenges, as I said. And uh, we provide this toolbox so that this toolbox could sort of lead to the nice design process when it comes to designing the IoT, IoT tools. Uh, and uh, often we, uh, we are asked about, but how do I address security? Uh, we don't believe that there is a general guidelines uh, that can be proposed to address security issues because security is not an, only a technical problem. And uh, our findings relate that security is more of an awareness, mindset, and people and process issue. And uh, in the end is that security uh, is not just needed, but we believe that it's mandatory characteristic if you want to design the IoT system. Uh, some of the remaining challenges uh, is, I think, uh, uh, standardization. Uh, we have a lot of standards in place and often this also creates a confusion to the developers what kind of standards I need to use. Uh, the only standard that I think currently that it's proven that it works is, is HTTP, right? It, it is sort of standard because it works and everybody kind of uses the HTTP. Uh, and we believe from our studies that we should maybe uh, start thinking less about standardizations while becoming more accustomed to open approaches such as the ones that we are providing here. Another remaining challenges that we believe will be uh, in, in is becoming a challenge is data. So we believe that uh, in the age of big data, traditional architectures and infrastructures are not up to the challenge. So they are not meeting the user uh, challenges because more and more users are expecting a sort of self-service access to information in a form that they can easily understand and share with others. And we believe that data and connected services are the real value of IoT platforms and data will drive and is driving the value of IoT platforms. So more and more companies are shifting their business models from selling products only to sort of uh, handling the data. That's why we need to sort of uh, make a research a bit more in the, in the area of data, such as data science that is becoming a hype lately uh, with some analytics, right? So we could understand uh, and identify more components or proper components in order to address. And uh, Another aspect that will stay, as I mentioned, is security, uh, because securing the Internet of Things represents the new challenges in terms of type, of scale, complexity, and all the technologies and services that are required. Uh, so uh, we need to really be careful uh, with the data itself, uh, because powering down or interfering with millions of devices through a single IoT vulnerability, such as the case with uh, Philips Ulight, can result sometimes also in physical damage to environments and injuries and death. So we need to be very careful when it comes to security and privacy aspects. And this brings us to kind of wrap up uh, this uh, presentation. Uh, and I usually include this picture from, from Kandinsky, um, uh, and it is about uh, beautifulness of this picture. I guess uh, all of you would like to have an original painting, but I think it costs a lot. Uh, 
since we were talking about the costs. Uh, but I think uh, this picture is beautiful and we, we see that there is a lot of shapes, sizes, colors, and this is a sort of situation with the uh, with, uh, Internet of Things that we, we stand in, in this. And uh, often we as engineers and some of you also in, as mathematicians, we believe that, okay, with engineering and mathematics, we could solve uh, this kind of situation uh, right because a lot of things are not are very abstract here so how do we make sense from this kind of picture of internet of things let's say and uh, our results point out that uh, engineering is not a, a solution to this kind of challenges so it's not meeting up we need a broad spectrum of uh, researchers users involved uh, such as as i mentioned maybe having a computer scientist sitting with a mathematician, sitting with a designer, sitting with a, with a health personnel in order to, to develop a right solution. And that we call it composition. So we need a composition by integrating different minds in order to address these kind of challenges that we are facing uh, today. So uh, these are some of my recent publications and uh, happy to uh, discuss with you uh, some of the results that I have uh, presented here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bastia, for this uh, very interesting presentation. And uh, I have to admit that uh, uh, much more relevant to our lives, uh, even as mathematicians, <laughs> than uh, the usual presentations uh, we have. Uh, so uh, thank you. Uh, what I propose next is uh, to see if uh, people have, uh, uh, participants have any questions. I think Eliot, who I would like to, uh, Eliot Butucci, I'd like to thank in particular, uh, because he's the one who reached out to Bahiar to organize the seminar. He has written uh, in his uh, question, uh, and it has to do with uh, uh, smart versus uh, surveillance. He says, uh, we could make our life uh, smarter, but we could also be more surveyed. How to address the need for same security standards across various manufacturers? That's, uh... Uh, thank you. I think this is a very great, great question. I would say, I, would, uh, uh, I think there is, as I mentioned in one of my slides, there is no guidelines on how we could address this, but there is also at the same time, especially in EU, there is GDPR in place. So despite that companies can uh, just release a tool, they also need to comply to GDPR, right? Especially when it comes to the surveillance. And there is quite harsh, I would say, regulations that we need to address. And those regulations should be translated into the design of the more uh, secure and less surveillance systems. Uh, that's why we are working uh, with more with, with the design aspects, because we believe that in order to address, uh, as you say, uh, the very kind of surveillance, which is related to, to privacy aspects, uh, uh, we need to think about the very design of the system itself. Uh, of course, uh, nothing is guaranteed. We will still have surveillance systems, but we as researcher, uh, we need to highlight those obstacles, and it's our job to 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 do that. Um, great. Uh, are there any questions? Uh, so, if there are any questions, please either write in your question in in the discussion, uh, or you just. I have... I have a question. Yeah, got, yes. Please, could you introduce yourself? Because I, I don't see who's speaking. Please. Uh, I'm going to it. Uh, yes. I, okay. Uh, I come. Okay. So I I work in this field too, uh, but uh, in in a different like division, if I can say. Uh, I I am more focused on small buildings. So my question would be, uh, part of your research, uh, is it like do you have any research focused on uh, an industrial or small building side of IoT or uh, it's more like uh, uh, residential uh, where users can buy IoT devices and uh, pull them I, at home. 
Thank you, Gerhard. I think uh, the idea of my research is to make it available both for uh, end users as well, because the idea is that we need to make also the end users more aware of the certain aspects when it comes to security privacy. But it's also about the, the, uh, the IoT industry that is uh, located in, in Sweden. And we do kind of jointly work with them in order to trying to uh, discover best practices on how we could address, uh, let's say, you want to develop uh, or you want to implement a smart building solution, right? Uh, how do we do it? What kind of uh, technology measures we need to do? Uh, what kind of security measures we need to have in place? That's why we are kind of proposing this uh, security toolbox, or let's say, which kind of helps us to uh, address certain challenge when it comes to implementing uh, smart buildings from a security point of view. So we, we do a little bit of everything. <laughs> Great, uh, thank you. Uh, are there any questions from the audience? Um, yeah. Uh, so, hi, I'm Hamdi. Um, thank you for the nice talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, I wanted to ask you something about the security part of, of this I, like IoT systems. Um, in one of those slides, you said that even if there is a security solution, it is hardly kind of implemented. So I guess my question would be, like, what is currently implemented when it comes to like security algorithms to encrypt data uh, within these systems? I could barely hear you, but I think your question is like, how do we implement the right security measures? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I think, uh, first of all, it should come up, as I said, from the security mindset of the and security culture of the organization. Let's say this is a company and I have uh, I'm working in a sort of uh, product development for IoT. We develop a uh, smart light. And the idea is that they often, often these companies, they just want to release the product to the market, right? Because they want to gain from that. What we believe is that we need to look at the security from day one before even thinking about the product. So we need to have security culture into this organization, into the developers. So this is the, the whole idea of this sort of uh, security thinking, let's say, approach that we are mentioning here. Okay, are there any other questions? Okay. okay, so um, I, I have a, a, a sort of a, a very general question because it, it has to do with the methods that you use. I'm, I'm very, of course, <laughs> interested in, in, in how do you um, conduct your um, research because, for example, in one of the slides you mentioned, among, among other things, you do interviews, etc. I mean, how, how does it work? Do you... Uh, compare the various IoT systems and then um, and then compare what's written in the literature and then compare what are the concerns of uh, citizens and uh, governments and the industry. So how, how do you go about doing it? Because it seems a very complex <laughs> process. Yeah. Uh, always research is very complex and that's why we need to conduct research, but we always need to utilize uh, certain methods, right? To, to reach the goal. So I don't think that the research methods is something that you choose from day one, but it's something that you, uh, by, the, by, by doing research, you say, oh, okay, I need to, to do this in order to understand this phenomenon, right? But usually when you start with the research, first thing is, that you need to look at the literature, right? So state of the art, what does it tell us? And that brings us to the more like systematic literature approach where you build up evidence from the existing scientific work. And this is very much very famous. This method is very famous in medical sciences because they constantly do this kind of work. 
because they build evidence from other researchers. And now in, uh, in software engineering, we are utilizing that approach. Then those results can bring us needs, right? And those needs can be translated to goals, to requirements. It depends what kind of, what is your research uh, that you're dealing with. And if, if it is about designing something, then you move to prototyping, right? The design process, you develop a prototype. But then what you do, you need to test it. So you need to test it with users because the users are the final. So then you say, okay, now I will be utilizing user, user centric approach so that I collect data. But then sometimes you need to say, oh, I need to do interviews. It's very hard to do interviews. But until the interviews, you see, there is a lot of background that, we, that, that will follow you until the interviews, because the questions that you will be asking, also it depends what kind of interview you do. There is different methods, like right? semi-structured, unstructured, open discussion, you name it. So uh, until you have the right questions, you need to sort of validate those questions, right? And there is certain, uh, methods, validity methods that you could validate the question so that the, the interview or the survey that you design is valid. So it depends uh, how you do it and the way you do it. But of course, interview is not the first option. Great. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Bertier. Of course, uh, um, that explains also some of the difference with uh, research in, in mathematics, where, yes. <laughs> where with there are other methods. So I thank you very much for your presentation. Very clear and interesting presentation. I thank uh, you in particular for the last uh, slide. Uh, you know, uh, with Kandinsky, <laughs> who uh, who used math in his in his art. Uh, yes. So, uh, so that's uh, that's beautiful. I'm, I'm sorry, there's a little noise. Uh, sorry for the noise. Uh, so, um, so I thank you again. I thank all the participants, and I uh, invite you to join us uh, uh, in March uh, on March 14 for our next seminar. And uh, Bahtiar, I uh, look forward to meeting you in person when you are in, in Pristina. Thank you so much. Yes, I look forward to, and uh, I guess during the summer we can we can have a coffee or something. Thank you, yes, my yeah. pleasure. Thank you, I did so I hope uh, it was interesting and uh, I do hope uh, people can contact me. Yes, yes, and, and I think if it's possible for you to send me the, the slides and then I will uh, uh, I will send them to the participants. I will do that. Thank you very much and have a nice day. Thank you. Bye bye. 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 bye.